I'm Gordon. I'm the Omnichannel Director at Lifestyle Sports. Um, you probably don't know who we are, so the great thing about these kind of events is that I get to market our business a little bit. Um, the content I'm going to cover today is going to be talking about how we've tried to create an omnichannel experience in our retail stores, um, what we've done in the past, what we're doing right now, and what our plans are for the future. Um, it's been a bit of a journey, and I'll take you through, through the journey that we've been on. And uh, one of the main partners that we've been working with throughout the whole piece has been, um, has been Agen. So a little bit about our business to, to kick off with. Um, Lifestyle Sports is an Irish-based retailer. Um, we compete on the high street, we compete online, um, and we go to market through core concepts. So we're probably different from other sports retailers in that we're not just a sports fashion retailer, although we cover that within our Trainer Central concept. Um, we're also sports performance, which is Faster Stronger and Women's Studio. Um, and our boot room business covers off team sports. So if you come into one of our stores, I'll show you what they look like in a second, uh, you can experience um, each, of those, each of those product concepts. So our business is based in Ireland. We have 54 stores and uh, quite a significant online business now that's about 20% um, of our total, um, our total revenues. Um, so we're relatively small. Of those stores, 52 are in Ireland, um, actually no, 48 are in Ireland, and four are in Northern Ireland. That will give you an idea of the type of customer that we target. So our customers and our general customer profile is quite young. They're athletically inspired. Um, so they take part, they participate in sport. They're very style led. So they want performance and they want innovation within the products that we sell, but they don't want to do that at the expense of, um, at the expense of how they look. And that's true across all of the categories that we operate in. Um, to that point then, the most important thing when we talk about digital for these guys and these girls is, is mobile. So about 66% of our sales um, and our um, traffic for the digital business comes through a mobile device. So mobile first is really, really important to us. But that said, still only 20% of our total business is done digitally. Um, and we invest massively in our stores. As I click. So if you think about the high street, the Irish high street is actually really similar to the high street in the UK. So there are some big brands in there that we're competing with. You'll see JD Sports, you will see Shoe, you will see Office, you will see Sports Direct. So as a local retailer, that's really challenging for us. And the key way in which we differentiate is through creating different experiences because we can protect our market share and we can protect our core retail business by delivering a better retail experience than our competitors. So the environments that I'm just about to show you cross our different concepts and they'll give you a feel for um, how we go to market in our stores um, in a different way to our competitors. So this is the trainer central concept, and it's around kind of being a cool place to hang out. But you can see the materials treatment that we use is quite urban. Then as you go into our, our, our faster, stronger environment, which is our men's training environment, you see that the, the kind of things that we have within that uh, pop out that training feel. Um, it's quite rough, again, quite urban styled. Women's Studio is completely different again. Loads of uses of, of rose gold, lo loads of uses of marble. The store environment is really, really important in here. The most important part of Women's Studio is that we have great changing rooms, so I'm told. And this means that, that it actually allows us to convert better in store. Now, all of this is relevant to digital. Our boot room, 
is completely different again and styled like a locker room. So if you come into one of our stores, you see each of these distinct areas. So a little bit like when you're building out your website, you want a distinct category feel for each of the categories that you're trading in. And what we try and do online is replicate this category feel um, through the digital environments that we have. Fundamentally, though, we are an experience business. And if you think about the kind of environment that we're in, uh, the competitors that we have and the products that we sell, there's very little opportunity for us to differentiate outside of experience. We sell Nike, we sell Adidas, we sell Under Armour, we sell Puma, uh, we sell Asics. Those are brands that you can get in the other stores on the high street and readily available online. So we have two choices. We can compete on price, which we all know is going to be margin erosive. Um, it's unsustainable in the long term. And it will be, we talk about the race to the bottom quite a lot. So, so price isn't an area that we compete in. We compete on experience. We're an experienced business. Um, and if you look at our Trustpilot reviews, um, our Trustpilot reviews will talk about us being great. We're either a one or a five. I'm sure anyone who's got reviews knows this. If your delivery arrives on time, you're a five. If it's late, it's a one. Um, but the sort of comments that you'll see through here are really helpful staff, great team members, super service. And this is linked to um, the way that we sell in store. And these reviews are solicited from, from customers where uh, they've bought something through one of our omnichannel solutions. They've interacted with a sales team member. Um, and we've asked them, well, what did you think? And more often than not, it's never about the delivery. It's all about the experience and how they felt when they left the store. So we focus on four things. We focus on our store environment and our store experience. So that enables us to differentiate if we've got a better environment than, than our competitors and we deliver better service at the point of sale. That enables us to convert more customers. And online, we focus on our online user experience and we focus on online fulfillment. So one of the great things that we have is that our distribution center is just outside Dublin where most of our customers are. And that means that we can ship faster and we can ship later than our competitors. So fulfillment, key point of differentiation. The problem that we have, though, is the problem that all retailers have that have been around as long as we have, legacy systems. So we're around about 40 years. Our ERP is about 40 years old. Um, so we know that we needed to change, and we knew that we needed to make some changes. But in the meantime, business is still happening. So if you're still faced with this issue of legacy systems, you need to find really smart ways of actually working through that. Um, and that is uh, where we got introduced to, um, got introduced to Agin. And one of the conversations we had, and this is a, a real question that I was asked by the rest of our board, is like, payments, they're just a commodity, right? You just need like the cheapest option. And that's not true, because payment and the payment experience can be used to build really strong customer experiences that differentiate your brand and result in positive customer reviews, which means that customers are more likely to come back because they enjoyed shopping with you. And if they're faced with a choice of two identical products, two identical price points, in two different environments, they're going to go for the experience that they enjoyed the most. So payments, really not a commodity. So our journey on Omnichannel and specifically the integration of payments started in 2014. So back in 2014, um, we were on the vendor platform, which no longer exists. Um, and we were introduced to, um, to an organization called One, I One Iota. And they were like, we have this kiosk solution. But we can make this kiosk solution available on an iPad. And we can integrate it with your website. And we can take chip and pin. So we'll have a pad on the back of your iPad. And it will integrate. And you'll be able to make sales in store. And I thought, this is a fantastic idea. Because it means that we're now going to be able to offer our customers in store, effectively an endless aisle solution. And nobody really in Ireland was doing this at the time. So off we went and, and, and we built it. But we quickly realized that actually the technology just needs to work. 
and it needs to be really simple for customers to understand and for um, our sales team members to understand. And that's what we were able to build here. So it was really simple. It was an iOS app. It wasn't integrated with our EPOS system. It was just integrated with the website. We used vendors APIs, which, to be honest, at the time were a little bit ropey. Um, and we used an Agent Ped on the back. And we built this little application that our store team members could then wear. And if a product was out of stock or not in their store assortment, or if they didn't have a size, they were able to order it from the distribution center, and we would ship it the next day. We also then realized that it's a great idea to drop technology into store, but who are the people that are most important in making this technology work? And we then realized that actually this has now moved from a technology project into a sales team member project. Training is really, really important, and engagement is really important. So um, our gang in store love using the iPads. Or they loved using them at that time. Uh, they still do. Um, and we spent a lot of time working on a number of things. So the things to get this to work is, first of all, uh, they need to understand what it is and why we are doing this as a business. That was really important. The second thing, then, was to make sure that they got two things, that they had clear visibility on what they sold and that it counted towards their targets. So they were properly incentivized around that. So we set up some league tables. It was quite difficult from a reporting perspective. We couldn't integrate it with our backend system, so we set up a separate little report, separate little league table, and distributed that every week around the stores and started to build in targets for the store teams. And I guess the message there was that um, the message that we got from our sales team members around that was, um, was that they loved it because it enabled them to sell more. It enabled them to not disappoint customers. So if they had a customer that was coming into their store, they wanted a size nine um, running shoe. We didn't have that running shoe available. They could get it to them tomorrow. They were able to close that sale, and it meant that that customer would come back into us rather than walk out of the front door of our stores and go into JD or Sports Direct and, uh, and buy something in there. So um, how did that go? Because that's great, me going, oh, and our sales team members loved it. But that's not what pays the bills. So what we immediately saw was um, an average store um, will take between 3 and 5% of their total turnover on Endless Isle. A great store will do up to 10%, and a rubbish store will do 1%. We don't really have any rubbish stores <laughs> anymore. Um, the other piece was that this quickly grew to 20% of our overall digital business, which was really exciting. So if you take our 100% of digital business, 20% of it now comes through these devices. And then of the other 80%, 66% of that is on a mobile device. So it's a great way to engage customers. So we got some really good results. And the whole thing just worked. But then in 2017, I don't know how familiar everybody is with, with e-commerce platforms, but Vendor was acquired by Oracle. Uh, Oracle had loads and loads of e-commerce platforms, so they decided to close it. So that meant that as part of our digital transformation journey, we needed to accelerate a change in platform. So at that point, um, we started to look at our broad system scope. And our broad system scope actually meant now is time for us to start rethinking about our ERP and our POS. We've proven the business case for Omnichannel using the iPads, cheap and cheerful. Um, we now have a really solid business case to start transforming the whole business. So we selected Salesforce, we selected Dynamics, and we decided to stick with Agent. The challenge here is that this ERP implementation is a two to four year program, and we still needed to keep the business running. So at that point, um, we decided the first thing that needs to move is online, and the reason that it needs to move is because it's key to engaging our customers because they're already on their mobile device, and it's key for our in-store business. So then we moved out. We swapped our pad, we swapped our jacket, and we were able to deliver, see what's on the next slide, we were able to deliver some significant changes to our business. Um, 
historically, Agen were the payment provider just for um, the PEDs on the in-store devices. As part of this first phase of the project, we were then able to roll Agen services into our dot-com business, so on the site. Um, and that meant a couple of things for us. It meant that we were able to move to one platform that allowed us to do uh, merchant, uh, to allow us to access gateway services, uh, risk management, processing, and acquiring. So this is really easy then for us to implement. Um, and we were able to then implement it across two of our core sales channels. We were able to do that quite quickly. The whole implementation process for Salesforce took us about six months to do. So it was relatively rapid. And one of the easiest components was payments. Um, it also meant that we were able to improve the in-store iPad experience. So historically, we weren't able to see any customer data on the iPads. Using the Salesforce Endless Isle solution as a replacement, we were able to pull customer details forward. So now our sales team members can process orders more quickly. They can look at what customers had been buying previously, and they can make recommendations of it. So that enables them to build out some kind of clienteling behavior. Um, other things that it opened up for us. So previously, our e-commerce payment platform was really rigid. But this allowed us to roll in new payment methods that we hadn't been able to use before, most notably Apple Pay. Apple Pay was then really important, because if you think about our customer and what I was saying earlier, mobile is absolutely key for them. And if you think about Ireland as a whole, Ireland over-indexes on Apple as a device type. So it's slightly different to some other European territories where Android has a larger share. Um, by far and away, Apple has the, have the larger share and iPhone has the larger share of the mobile market. So rolling in Apple Pay as part of that project was, was a really good idea for us. Um, we also have um, quite a lot of international tourists. Uh, so, um, and we, we sell internationally. So we were able to implement Union Pay. Um, and that was really painless. So it meant that we were able to deliver some great results. Um, oh, there we go. That was, what, that was what, we, what we implemented. Revenue Protect was the other solution that we implemented at this point. And previously, we had very limited control over how we managed the fraud rules for our customer. It was very, very black and white. It was a yes or it was a no, and there was nothing in between. And what Revenue Protect allowed us to do was actually start exploiting this gray area where we might, we're not sure if we want to accept this payment. We could accept this payment, but let's check it out in a bit more detail. So we were able to implement that seamlessly as part of the flow. Um, and we were able to have more control over the number of variables that we used to make a decision on whether or not we accepted a transaction. And believe it or not, in our industry, uh, fraud is quite high. Um, fraud's quite high for a number of reasons. The trainers are really desirable and really resellable, and the same with football kit. And they're the two types of product that we have the biggest challenges around managing um, whether or not we accept a transaction. What we were able to do in this instance, though, um, is be a little bit looser on the transactions that we did accept and measure that against the level of chargebacks that we got. I've already talked about mobile payment. Um, we did start to see higher acceptance rates on our payments. And ultimately, if it was a transaction from a genuine customer that we previously would have refused, and we then went on to accept, that delivered a better experience for them. And as an experienced business, that's the most important thing that we can do. But changes don't pay the bills. And this number here represents the increase in conversion rate that we saw over peak in 2018. So a 27% lift in our conversion rate translated to a significant revenue figure and a significant margin figure for us. And we attributed that to a number of things. A better experience um, on our site, a better experience in our stores using the mobile devices, and a better experience on checkout. In fact, on checkout, we actually saw 
10% more people getting through checkout than were getting through checkout previously when we had really tight rules within that. So then on to 2019. Um, and this is where it starts to get really exciting for us. So we will be moving again away from Salesforce. And we've started to work with Microsoft. Um, we will keep Salesforce as our core e-commerce platform. And we will be extending Agion as our main point of sale payment provider. And that will give us a couple of other benefits. Uh, the other big challenge that we have for um, 2019 is expanding our business regionally across Europe. So being able to configure new payment methods is really, really important as part of that. So the objective of, of actually doing this is something called unified commerce. So we know that our customers shop cross-channel with us. Instinctively, we know this because of the online returns that we get, 90% of them are returned to one of our stores. Um, and the reason that our store returns are so high is that our stores are adjacent to places like supermarkets. They're, they're, they're on pretty much every Irish high street. So they're all in really high footfall locations. And it's really easy to return something to store for a customer. For us, not so much. So the previous returns experience for a customer when they come into store, and we know that returns are really important for them, is that they would return something, we would take their credit card off them, and our sales team member would have to do a refund without receipt on our unconnected EPOS system onto whatever card was presented in front of them. And it left us open to all kinds of issues around, uh, sadly, sales team member fraud, um, delays, most importantly, in the length of time it takes to process a return. But now we, will, we are now building an experience where we can see payments right the way through our channels. We'll also be able to see customer orders right the way through all of our channels. And what this will mean is that when you come into one of our stores, if you want to return something, then you'll be able to return it with one, our sales team member will be able to return it with one click, the payment will be refunded to them straight away, and they'll be able to walk out. Uh, we'll also have a record of that that we'll be able to surface to our online systems so that customers will be able to see, um, to be able to see what they've returned, what they've bought, what channel they bought it in, and have a full view of that. From a CRM perspective, that really helps us also because we now start to build up this omni-channel picture. The other thing that was really important for us is when, when you're undertaking a project like uh, replacing your ERP and replacing your MPOS, it's really quite, it, quite all-encompassing for the business. So as a retail business, we have impacts on our buying team, impacts on our merchandising team, our finance team, less so on the marketing team, definitely on the omni-channel and e-commerce team. And one of the things that, that made this really easy was that, or is making this really easy, uh, because we haven't done it yet, uh, is a direct integration between Agent and Microsoft Dynamics. So that means that Dynamics ships out of the box, full stack Agent implementation then will be faster, easier, and lower cost for us to implement. So the kind of benefits that we're expecting to see from this. We're expecting to see improvements in, um, in our store ordering rate. We are expecting to see improvements in our online conversion rate further. We're expecting, most importantly, to see two, two measures. One is an improvement in customer experience and an improvement in NPS, Net Promoter Score. Because we believe that as an experienced business, the better experience you drive, the more people will recommend you, the more people will come back in to shop with you again. So the kind of things that we're going to now deliver in store that we haven't been able to do before. Uh, Omnichannel returns I've talked about already. New payment methods. New payment methods for both online and for our store customers. And one of the things that Agent have been really at the forefront of is delivering new payment methods before anybody else. So that means that when a new payment method becomes available, we'll be able to adopt that, not just online, not just mobile, not on our in-store terminals, but across our entire estate. And we'll be able to do that quite quickly. 
Um, it will enable um, not only store transactions um, for remote ordering and delivery through the MPOS systems, but it will also enable us to queue bust. So the new POS systems that we'll be putting into store that will replace the iPads that we have will enable um, a sales team member to grab one of them and just queue bust and actually close transactions either at the footwear wall, at the door, um, or even at the till point if they need to. So it'll enable us to queue bust at key times. And if you look at peak and December, the single major cause of frustration for customers whilst they're doing their Christmas shopping, and we've all been there because we've all been that customer, is standing in a queue waiting for somebody to check you out at the till. It will give us better analytics. So it will enable us to be able to see exactly how customers are shopping with us. Are they buying online, returning in store, then buying in store, then coming back to buy on mobile? We'll be able to start piecing this together using the analytics and card information that we have. Um, the integration is simple, relatively. No payment integration is easy, but um, this is a relatively simple integration for us to do. And then the biggest win for our finance team, because everyone neglects the finance team, they're like, deal with your spreadsheet and sort out your general ledger, is that they will have one single system for reconciliation. So that means instead of dipping in and out of multiple providers, they'll be able to save time and they'll be able to save money by doing all the reconciliation through one interface, which is fantastic for them because it means that they can spend more of their time uh, working on finance value adds. Although I'm not that close to the finance team, so I don't know what value they add other than sending me a P&L once a month. So to recap on it um, and, and to close it off, we're an experienced business. And for us, it's really important to find ways in which we can make that customer experience have less friction for them and be much more enjoyable. Because if we don't continually and relentlessly focus on driving better experiences for our customers, there are plenty of other retailers that will be quite happy to take those customers from us. Um, that's really uh, the other thing I suppose I should cover off is that creating that omni-channel journey in store wasn't something that we just did overnight. So it has so far taken us five years to get to this point. And the way that we started was finding the lowest cost, easiest point of entry into actually delivering it to prove the business case, to build it out further, and ultimately build that final business case for why we should make the significant investment in getting rid of our legacy systems. That's all I've got to say. Um, hopefully it was, um, it was quick and informative, um, but we've got some time to take some questions. Okay, so in terms, of the in terms of the distribution share question, it's about 80-20 for retail at the moment. So that's in Ireland. Uh, our international business is 100% online, uh, with the exception of uh, the four stores that we have in Northern Ireland. Um, then in terms of European distribution and European expansion, uh, the first thing we need to do is prove a market and then once we've proven the market, we'll do the same thing that we've done or the same principle that we did within, um, within our omni-channel business, prove it, build a case for it, then start working on things like distribution centers because that is going to become incredibly expensive very quickly. And talking to some of the other retailers that, um, that we share, um, if, you, if you talk um, to companies like ASOS, uh, they are still doing a lot of their global distribution out of the UK, and we're looking at ways to kind of prove that model and then expand our distribution beyond that. Um, we don't know. <laughs> um, 
Um, we don't know what the effects will be. We do know what our plan will be. Um, so we'll be working with, um, we'll be working quite closely with Agin throughout it. Um, and we'll be looking at ways in which we can minimize any additional friction that would be, that would be applied, which is a really kind of nebulous answer. <laughs> but we actually don't know what the full impact is going to be. Um, good question. Um, so Google Shopping, really important channel for us. Um, but we take quite a pragmatic view towards shopping. And um, for our business, there are certain tiers of product. So there is very, very low value product, which, to be honest, doesn't have a great deal of margin in it. So we fill it that away because we're going to move that value piece of, of our business. And when we say we don't compete on price, we don't aim to be cheaper than others, but we aim to be at market, at market average. Then we have a top tier of products. And within that top tier of products, there's usually limited distribution and there is limited allocation. So we don't, we don't go after that on Google Shopping either because that will sell through. So then you're left with the volume products in the middle. And those are generally um, quite desirable products um, they're highly technical products, as a rule, and generally the prices on that are pretty stable. So you will see us in line with our competitors. So that then comes back to the point around experience. So the kind of things that we then do are just really simple. Make sure that our Trustpilot rating um, and our star rating is actually in our Google Shopping feed. Um, if customers don't know us, and they don't know us by reputation or they haven't shopped with us before, um, then that will give them confidence to buy. But we certainly wouldn't be looking to continually undercut on Google Shopping. Where it's great, it gives transparency to customers. Where it's bad for retailers is that it gives complete transparency to customers. All right. Thank you very much, everyone.